<laughs> Tonight, we're going to be taking you through our first two shows, uh, including a number of household favourites, as well as six songs that have never been performed before. First, though, we wanted to give you a bit of a sense of our history. Alex and I have been best friends since Mrs. Burns swapped him in for Sarah Norman in the October half-term of 1999 class school seating plan. It didn't take long for us to become best friends and to come up with our first major project, a fictional children's TV show called Kiddie Wings Playtime. Kiddie Wings Playtime was a regularly broadcast show with a fun yet educational content, um, usually focused around another of mine and Alex's shared passions, luxury overpriced stationery. We co-hosted the show, as well as, for the first and only time in our writing careers, co-writing the theme tune.
myself in my end jig, high as down the line, but here we are. Anyway, along with high comedy, there was heartbreak too.
the Golden Empress and, unbeknownst to the rest of the society, has appointed a professional director for this production. Fresh from the Lithuanian premiere of Miss Saigon, several episodes of Doctors, and a post-apocalyptic dystopian reimagining of Annie Get Your Gun at the West Yorkshire Playhouse, enter director Max Steiner. mostly involving controversy over who will play the title character. The Golden Empress was an occasional nickname of Catherine the Great of Russia, for those of you not sufficiently au fait with your 18th century East European history. Uh, yes, no, I, I don't. Um, it's for everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the middle of Act 2, it's all looking a bit bleak, which is very structurally original, and ex-West End chorus girl Rose, who ends up abandoning the show for a non-speaking part in the regional tour of Downton Abbey the Musical, and possibly overbearing Honoria, reflect on the life-ruining mistakes they feel they've made in the high stakes, serious business of a regional Amtram. <laughs>
Writing Amjam was pretty nerve-wracking. We committed to doing the show before we actually had any material, which is like textbook for us, basically. Um, and our first writing session produced the opening number, as you heard earlier, so we felt that we were off to a good start. Uh, but we both, although we didn't voice these concerns to one another, were petrified that we would peter out after four or five decent numbers, whack in another couple that were a little bit ropey, do a one-act, one-hour job, and call it a day. Somehow, though, this didn't happen. It just kind of worked and kept working. But part of that meant that we were writing in the middle of the night, we scribbled stuff on the back of receipts, uh, and for this number, so we now have a very set working pattern. Uh, Alex does the music first and I write the lyrics, but then we were still feeling our way. Um, for this one, I wrote the words, I sent them over to Alex, which is the only time uh, that we've done an exception to our music then lyrics rule. Uh, and it's for the next song, which is a mid-act one solo for professional director Max. I sent Alex the words, he sent me back a Grammy-worthy recording from the pub, <coughs> again, uh, which thankfully ended up instead sounding a little bit like this. There must have been a small misunderstanding. I'll take a moment so that we can all be clear. And I'm sure we can avoid a situation I've experienced before in my career. Once or twice when working in the theatre, there's a discord of personality. Well, I've come across a couple of these discords, and now I implement a little policy. I don't have any divas in my show. No, I will not have any divas in my show. Don't think you can come in with a list of your demands. Don't try to win me over. I'm immune to all your charms. I learned this at La Scala and a theatre pub in Barnes that I will not have any divas in my show. Now I realise you all need to be nurtured in your chance to be artistically free. We feel you need a place to be creative. I think it's best we leave that all to me. Don't forget it's my name on the billing behind every ticket that we've sold. Remember that it's my dramatic vision and the bottom line is you'll do as you're told. But look, I won't have any divas in my show. I just will not have any divas in my show. You could be Lance Olivier with Audrey Hepburn's face. Sing sweetly as an angel from soprano down to bass. You could say all the lines from Hamlet with a smile of Princess Grace. But I will not have any divas in my show. The theatre's all about collaboration, as I learned in my time at the RSC. So there's no time or scope for prima donnas, unless of course the prima donna's me. Are we clear? I won't have any divas in my show. I simply shan't have any divas in my show. So put each other down, because I've no more time for fights. You're not pouring out your souls with the Oscar in your sights. But rather like Clark Gable, I just don't give a damn. I don't think that you understood that am comes before dram. It's not as though there's going to be a premiere in Cannes. You could be truly Sonic Andrews. Well, I don't want to know, because I will not have any divas in my show. about Amdram and we had the chance to do this when it was performed again at the University of Chichester. We felt the first time round we hadn't quite captured that uh, exciting post-audition moment and so we added this number to give people a fuller sense of the joys of community theatre. <laughs> Delay. 
going on? When will this all start? When will the phone ring? Now if something doesn't work, we're like, no, it's hopeless, scrap it. Um, but then we didn't really want to say, oh, I'm not sure if this is working. Um, so we struggled on doing this for ages and ages with an original set of lyrics that I had written. Uh, and finally, at the end of the day, I said, do you know what, I don't think this is going to happen. And Alex was like, oh my God, thank God. Uh, so we threw away what we had had uh, and came up with this. Workshop at the end of 2014. 
This turned out to be a slightly bigger and trickier job than we had anticipated. Suffice it to say, uh, it was about Garibaldi and the Italian reunification. It had more than 35 songs in it, and the writer had been working on it for more than 30 years, which is, of course, <laughs> all the ingredients for an international smash. Uh, but we did get a couple of gems out of doing it. Just to give you a further sense of exactly what we were working with, the protagonist spent most of the show being followed around by the spirit of his wife, who miraculously appeared even though she had died a decade earlier in Uruguay. Garibaldi spent a lot of time arguing with his dead wife about how to mastermind the Italian revolution. I mean, we've all been there. Uh, but as the show draws to a close, they reconcile. <laughs>
There's magic everywhere when those house lights go down. The show's about to start. There's magic everywhere in theater's greatest town. Every single part is a work of art. The audience is rapture, is difficult to capture. Is the greatest show of all. Here we are to celebrate the year's best plays, the musicals we adore. All the stand up theatre on the UK stage, this year's most revered awards. Whatever to the Tonys, those boring Broadway cronies, they're all transfers, it's here they begun. It's the West End world where we show them how it's done. Here in London's town, and there's so much you can do. Take a chance on Antarctic dance, or a mind can be for part two. All across our wondrous nation, each theatrical location, at venues big or small. Where else would you go for the greatest show? Thousands try each year for the shot of fame, their theatrical debut. Part of years and years of work to make your name, and one day you might break through. The years of doing bit parts, the years of doing shit parts, the years of doing panto in slides. So let's say hello to the brand new stars of now. Judy Dench, so good to see in our first big speaking part. Imelda Staunton, mark my words, her career's about to start. The good for you and the bad man's dreams of being Michael Ball And aspiring for the great show The competition's fiercer than it's ever been It just gets more tough to choose If it were up to us then everyone would win But somebody has to lose Everybody's bitter, they're pitching through our Twitter The crazies and the gays start to cry <laughs> That's just how it goes when the audience decides. Kinky Boots, the fully class, Gypsy Elf, and Henry Five. Or is Spire in the Heights? What a time to be alive! The best is when they're acting, is controlling their reacting. When it's not their name, we call. They can't hold at the greatest show of all. The atmosphere's electric, backstage is getting hectic, and of course, there's my ball. <laughs> Where else would you? Stage Awards, which we've done twice now and is always great fun. So thank you to Stuart Piper and also to Watson Stage for having us. Doing these numbers and a couple of other openers that we've done over the years, for many, many years, uh, <laughs> along with the success um, and second performance of Amdram, suddenly made this musical theatre writing thing uh, something that we do. Naturally, that meant time to think about what the next full-length show might be. For this, we wanted to challenge ourselves in a slightly different way, something a little bit straighter, rather than more on the parody end of things, and we wanted to have a crack at an adaptation. Having spent weeks looking at lists of best books and deciding that Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time was just a little long, uh, we decided instead to settle our national favourite, The Railway Children. <laughs> How did you sleep earlier? Morning. Ruth, could you sweep the Morning. Oh, let's go out and play. We're ready for another day. Parcel. In on the side, please. Washing. Back once it's dried, please. Peter. Thank you. 
children, Bobby, Peter and Phyllis, move to the country near a railway, which forms the basis of many of their adventures. Mother has always made things up for the children, stories for bedtime, poems, songs for birthdays, and without father decides to take up writing and sells children's stories to editors so the family has enough money. The children, who adore their mother, always want to hear the latest. me a story
growing up, the transition from childhood to adulthood. And the main embodiment of this is the oldest child, Bobby. Bobby and her mother have a really close relationship with Bobby doing everything she can to support mother in looking after the other children. The reason for father's absence hasn't been explained, but Bobby has heard mother crying at night and knows that something is wrong. In the first act, mother falls ill and Bobby spends days caring for her. One day, a confused and frightened man turns up at the railway. Mother recognises him as a Russian writer and political prisoner and takes him into their home. That night, she explains to the children the sadness and loneliness of prison and asks them to remember all the world's prisoners and captives, which, unbeknownst to them, includes their own father, when they say their prayers. Bobby? Yes? Ought we to say our prayers now? Are you ready for bed? Have you washed your face? Yes? Then yes, we had better, just as Mother said. You can come in my bed as Mother will be in yours. <laughs> Yes. 
with the bureaucracy, snobbery, and total lack of progress she's faced in trying to free her husband, takes a moment to let everybody know she's not going to be giving up any time soon. Protected from pain. 
story this evening, but there was nothing really that was. Um, <laughs> but this isn't actually always that easy, uh, and Alex and I are aware that a lot of the burden of doing this is taken by our family and friends who do incredible things to support and help us when we're tired, or grumpy, or upset about something, or we screwed something up, and we take it out on the people. Um, love you, Mum and Dad. Uh, and even when things are going well, there's a huge amount of support that we get from so many people in so many different ways, particularly from our families, uh, who are incredible about this slightly mad circus. And so we just wanted to take a moment to let you know uh, that we appreciate what a group effort this is and what people are doing for us. I'm going to inelegantly uh, get round to the piano, and we're going to do. Alex and I are going to do a little number now. <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> we put that one together today. Seamless. Right. Okay. There's actually no music. It's fine. It's fine. We, we as Alex said, we won it. Or we won it. I don't know what you said earlier. Right. So, whew. after what has turned out to be quite a serious second half, we'd like to end with a taste of our next show, which is a little lighter, and on in Guildford in September, to which you should all be buying tickets. Obviously you will be. Thanks, guys. Um, and also, in fact, on that note, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, you've been very sweet. Thank you for coming and listening. Uh, please stay for a drink, and we hope that you've had a great time. Uh, Alex and I would like to thank, of course, Deborah, Jordan, Nadim, Jessamy, and Laura, Jonathan, Hannah, Hannah, and Adam, and Alistair, and Martin. Um, for all their work on this evening, obviously, without you, it would have been So, a bit of a gear change from the railway children. Oh all aboard. <laughs> Brace yourselves. Okay. All aboard follows customer service manager Stella Makins and the crew of the cruise ship the Queen Wilhelmina who face various disasters in our own 1970s style mashup of a sort of classic 30s English farce uh, and a classic American musical. Thank you again everybody for coming. We'll leave you with this and good night. <laughs> Shabish.